And now, Lord, may you speak through me, or if need be, in spite of me, as we meditate upon the word as you have given it to us. Give us wisdom and understanding, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. I heard a story some time ago about a man who had applied for a job as a manager of a company, uh, and his final interview was with the boss. And as he was sitting in the boss's office being interviewed, the phone rang, and the boss decided it was going to be a spot test of how this manager would, would act. And so we have the, the, the candidate answer the phone. He picked up the phone very smoothly, identified the company and himself, and then he repeated the name of the caller as someone would if they were making a note. And the boss's eyes rolled a bit when he heard the name and he started to make those signs, you know, I'm not here. Tell him I'm not here, I don't want to talk to him. Uh, nevertheless, when the caller asked specifically for the boss, the prospective manager immediately said, well, he's right here, I'll let you talk to him, and he handed the phone over. Now, you can imagine what the boss's face would have looked like. You know, purple, red, eyes bulging out, yet trying very carefully to be calm and demeanor on the phone. And when he hung up, he rounded on this prospective employee. He said, what the heck was that all about? I was very clear with you, I thought. I didn't want to talk to him. I was telling you that I'm not here. Tell him I'm not here. And the fellow said to him, well, you know, I figure that if I'm the kind of person who can lie for you, I can probably lie to you. And if you can't trust me to be 100% honest with you or with anyone else, all the time, any time, I guess I don't have a place here. And the boss heard that and immediately hired him on the spot. I'm thinking that the wealthy man in the parable uh, could have used a man like this instead of the one that he had. Uh, now, that parable, the parable of the dishonest manager, it, it is not considered one of, but it is considered the hardest parable in the Gospels from which a preacher can try to extract Christian meaning and bio Christian truth. Partly it feels incomplete. Something's missing. We're short an ending, or perhaps just an explanation. I mean, Jesus explained out the parable of the sower. When he, when he was done saying the parable of the sower to the crowd, he took his disciples aside and he said, okay, you guys know what the four soils are, right? And this is what they are. Um, with, with the parable of the Good Samaritan, the context of that was, you know, he'd been challenged about who and what is my neighbor that, that uh, Leviticus says, love my neighbor as myself. Uh, in Matthew 6, he explains out the Lord's Prayer, or at least the forgiveness part. Because he, he makes sure they understand what it means when we say, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. But here there's no explanation. Nothing to help us parse out verse 9, and I tell you, make friends for yourselves by means of dishonest wealth, so that when it is gone, they may welcome you into the eternal homes. Now the words that follow this are, they, they seem linked to thoughts about wealth, but they don't really seem to connect with the par parable properly. It seems, as I say, like something is missing. Like it, It's like Luke, Luke dropped a note card when he was compiling everything to, to make his gospel, to put his gospel manuscript together. I mean, this isn't the prodigal son. The prodigal son, we know, ends ambiguously, but we know that the younger son asked for forgiveness. We know, or, or didn't ask for forgiveness. He just wanted to be welcomed back into the house, but he was penitent. And we know that the father welcomed him in because he loved him. We know that the older brother wasn't sure he could forgive. And as the reader and the listener, which character are you? That, that's the ambiguity of the ending. But in this, I mean, we've got the manager being commended for his shrewdness. That's the word that's in the translation. I've been reading this all week, and the closest I can come to a commendation is the master saying something along the lines of, you are one slick son of a gun. Now get out of here and never come back. It's a compliment about his shrewdness in a way. If the story were told today, if, if, if we had a complete story told today, we'd see the master questioning his dealings with those who owe him things. After all, they were willing to be a party to cheating him, because it meant that they owed him less. 
There would be more of a sense of justice needed. But we don't get that. And then Jesus moves to a slightly different lesson. Now, verses 10 to 13 are actually quite clear in what they are saying. Culminating in those unequivocal six words. You cannot serve God and wealth. The verse as a whole is a direct transfer from Luke 6, 20, or Matthew 6.24, where it was part of the Sermon on the Mount. And the fact that it's been repeated by two separate gospel writers means that it was important. We need to remember this. The words are simple to understand. If wealth is your aim, God cannot be. Wealth is quite possibly the side benefit of hard work and professional loyalty. Many people are compensated quite well for the work they do. And on the whole, it can be quite easy to agree with Paul that the worker is worth his or her wages. But if the acquisition of wealth becomes your end-all and be-all, it will replace God as the focal point of your life. Again, unequivocally, you can serve God or you can serve wealth. You cannot serve both. Consider the story of Millard Fuller. When Millard Fuller was six years old, his father gave him a pig. And after he fattened it up, he sold it for $11. And there was birthed a lifelong love of uh, commerce and wealth multiplication. He used that $11 to buy other small animals. And then he sold them later at further profit, and on and on it went. When his father bought a larger farm, not only was he able to move to buying and selling larger animals, but the two of them worked on refurbishing the old farmhouse for most of the first several months that they lived there. And he later spoke of the feeling of pride both of them had when the house was done, completed by the work of their own hands, with, admittedly, some help from others on some specialty elements. It sank into him the belief that you can do anything if you just work at it hard enough, And work he did. He eventually went to university for a commerce degree, followed it up by going to law school, where he and a fellow student ended up going into business together and starting a publishing empire. He'd earned his first million dollars by the age of 29. However, a couple of years later, a respiratory ailment brought him low for a time, and he had to take stock of his life. On close inspection, he found he really didn't like what he saw. First, he was a workaholic, absolutely dedicated to bringing in that next dollar. And his wife had been pushed off into a distant corner of his life. Despite his illness, or perhaps because of it, she found the courage to tell him that she was an inch away from leaving him because the things he was buying for her were not making her happy. Secondly, his faith had suffered. Can't have a relationship with God if you're out chasing the almighty dollar all the time, he realized. What to do? The answer was easy to say, but hard to give in to. Sell it all, refocus on the Lord, and live simpler. The luxury car, the lake house, and the boat all went, and Millard and Linda Fuller upped stakes and moved to rural Georgia. The church they started to attend there was looking for some practical ways to help those in need in their community. Poverty was all around, even in a small town. And lots of people were living in ramshackle, run-down houses, needing repairs they couldn't afford to make. Another idea took root in Millard Fuller's head. He talked to some of the folks, main question being, if we can provide the materials and the guidance, are you willing to help out making the repairs? When the answer was yes, the congregation would join together, purchase the materials, and make the repairs, with the person who lived in that house being foremost among the workers. But wait, someone said, what if the house is too far gone and needs to be completely replaced? Is it possible to do that? Fuller and some folks test drove that idea in Africa, having locals join in when they built entire clusters of houses over there. In 1976, the idea was rolled out in America with Millard Fuller front and center for the movement that would eventually be considered a revolution in philanthropy. Anybody guess what I'm talking about? Habitat for Humanity. 
To date, Habitat has put roofs over the heads of 4 million people, 800,000 refurbished, rebuilt, or um, renovated projects around the world. Those who are going to be living in the houses take an active hand in their construction, while volunteers surround them with help and expertise and use donated materials in the building process. A favorite story from, is from one of the first recipients of a new home who was asked what he liked best about it. He said, well, I like to go to the window when it's raining and watch the water come down outside and not drip on the top of my head. Now, the twist in this story comes about 11 years ago. Ever since starting Habitat, Fuller had been raising money. He had a gift for wealth. And he was raising money, but he was letting it flow through his hands to the people who needed it. And he felt that the organization should continue to operate on this model. However, as time had passed, more conservative individuals had been put on the board of directors for Habitat. And they were very concerned with rainy day funds and reserves, meaning a smaller percentage was getting through to the folks at the end of the line. This and other conflicts of vision led to, led to Millard and Linda Fuller stepping down from leadership in Habitat for Humanity in 2004. A study conducted in 2006 determined that in the case of about 2,000 American startup charities, a third of them had had their leaders ousted after a time, usually due to more conservative directors having been appointed as time went on. Now, the Fullers could have just retired. They could have just thrown their hands up in frustration and said, oh, fine, forget it, we're done. They didn't. They founded a separate group, the Fuller Center for Housing, worked somewhat in tandem with Habitat. And the golden touch continued. Within three months of establishing the center, Millard Fuller had $2 million in pledges already set for the center's work. And by the end of the third year, they had 45 projects going in 14 countries worldwide. He had a gift for wealth. But he put wealth in its place after that ailment uh, when he was in his early 30s. He served God. The money served God. In a 1995 interview, he told the reporter, he said, you're looking at a very happy man. Very busy. But Lynn and I work together now. And I derive much more joy making money for other people than I ever did from making it for myself. Millard Fuller died in 2009 at the age of 74. And I think if you'd asked him about what we'd heard today, he would say that he had indeed tried to be very, very faithful with what had been given to him. Here's the thing, though. Most churches today don't have a resident millionaire. Most churches today are like most people today. They're struggling just to make ends meet, let alone take up projects that may just change the world as we know it. Expenses are climbing, or are climbing rather, while revenues either stay the same or are declining. Many congregations have rainy day funds. We have rainy day funds. And those rainy day funds, they're starting to dip into them. Most don't have rainy day funds at all. With interest rates so low, investments that they're just not giving the return that they were when the money was first invested, and congregations that count on that money, that count on the, the, the interest revenue to make up the shortfall in givings, they're starting to eat into their principal. It's a grim time. If all we do is focus on the financial side of things. Now, I do have to share a story here that may seem a little disingenuous, but I think it applies. Uh, I was once at a conference uh, listening to a pastor. He, he described himself as pastor of a small megachurch. I didn't know small and megachurch went together, but in the States apparently they do. Megachurch is defined as a congregation that has 2,000 people or more joining in worship on a Sunday morning or on a, on a weekend. And there are churches down in the States that have 5, 10, 20 or more thousands of people gathering for worship. No, he said he's got 2,000 people. They had a budget of about $2 million and it was all congregational revenues. He said they'd made a pact a few years earlier when they were getting to this point. 
He said to his people, God didn't give us money to hold on to, to keep for rainy days, or to replace the carpet when time came. I mean, how many arguments have taken places in churches where you know someone is saying, well, we've got to save money because the carpet's going to need fixing. I've known several myself. But he said, no. What we do is the week after Christmas, he and a few of his elders sit down and they disperse everything. Everything that's left, everything that remains, every over and above that didn't go to revenues or projects or staffing or whatever, it all goes somewhere else. And so January 1st, they pay their payroll, they pay their monthly bills because they've kept the money for that, they know what's coming, but there's nothing left. He says if we need to replace the carpet, if we need to fix the roof, we'll do a project for that. And if ever a day comes when the money isn't there, well, maybe that's God just saying, you know, it's time to move on to something else. Until that day, though, they were going to keep on making sure they were running on empty as far as the church was concerned and getting the money out to those who truly needed it and being faithful to however much or little was being entrusted to them. Now, we still need money. Quite honestly, we're not making ends meet. That's part of what we're going to be talking about in a little while. We lost 15 members, both current and historic, in 2015 alone. And a few more this year. Limehouse's photo directory, if you ever look at it, it shows a lot of people who aren't in the congregation anymore. They're still at the church, but they're not in the congregation And as I say, expenses are going up. Revenue's going down. Insurance. Oh, I could go on about insurance for hours. Buildings get old. Contractors know that they can set their price because we have to pay it. The work has to get done. And on and on and on it goes. But why are we here? Are we here to keep the building open? No. We're here to share the gospel. We're here to share the love of God. We're here to stand by and stand with each other because we've been given by God to each other. We're here to pray for each other. We're here to love one another. We're here to be caring and compassionate. To lift each other up when we're down. To welcome in the stranger and make their needs our own. We're here to share life, not just the contents of our wallets. Money will not make us rich. It's a tool. And if used properly, you can do a lot with it, but it's still just a tool. It's just a thing. A gift from God as much as love and grace and forgiveness are. And realistically, we need those things a lot more. We've been entrusted with all these things, a little or a lot, and we need to be faithful in our stewardship of all of God's gifts to us. Let's pray. Lord, our world is one that is tremendously concerned with finances. We have entire television networks concerned with markets and values and cash in and cash out. We nitpick for nickels because we're petrified of running out. I heard someone say recently that money was the lifeblood of our modern world. And so many of those of us walking around believe it and see money as the end all and be all of our existence. We dread church finance reports as though how much money we have determines how faithful we are to your will and your way. We need confidence to face each challenge And see not the dollars and cents, but the lives that are touched and changed by the passage of your Spirit moving among us. 